Today's talk is sponsored by Hamilton Library, the Spark M. Matsunaga Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution, and the Departments of Asian Language, Asian Studies, and American Studies. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. <clears throat> Heather Diamond earned a PhD in American Studies from the University of Hawaii, was a graduate fellow at the East-West Center, and has worked as a university lecturer and curator at Iolani Palace before moving to Hong Kong. She is the author of American Aloha, Cultural Tourism and the Negotiation of Tradition, Tradition and Rabbit in the Moon, a Memoir, the subject of her talk today. Her creative nonfiction essays have appeared in Memoir Magazine, Sky Island Journal, Her Oix, Women's Lived Experiences of the Pandemic, uh, Rappahannock Review, Water Wheel Review, Hong Kong Review, Undomesticated, and Pacifica Review. In a review in the Contemporary Pacific of Heather's 2008 book, Alexis Celeste Bunton writes that American Aloha will interest a broad readership interested in Hawaiian culture and history, museums, representation, tourism, and the construction of nationalism. But prophetically, Bunton concludes her review this way, Diamond's skill at weaving theoretical themes with detailed data and anecdotes makes the book read like a collection of personal memories and characters with whom the reader can identify. This, I think, brings us to today. Her summary of Rabbit in the Moon indicates that marrying across cultural boundaries in Hawaii benefited the author, but becoming a foreigner in Hong Kong tested her relationships, her tolerance, and her adaptability. Her background in cultural anthropology became her survival tool as she struggled with not knowing Cantonese, resisting family communalism, and feeling like an outsider. Writing a memoir, however, required her to shed academic objectivity and speak honestly about her culture shock and personal limitations while trying to represent her adopted family as people instead of foreign caricatures. She will talk about that memoir today. Two other things. First, my own contacts and discussions over the years with Heather have always suggested to me that she places herself in difficult, stimulating and significant places. Iolani Palace comes to mind, but so does her academic work on the profoundly complicated Smithsonian Folklife Festival of 1989. And for that matter, her time in the American Studies Department during a time of major transitions. Second, there also seems to be, seems to be a soundtrack to her life as music weaves its way through all her experiences and transformations. I suspect we'll hear something today about both. To talk about Rabbit in the Moon and herself, Heather Diamond. Thank you, Craig. And, and I don't have to give a talk now because you've summarized everything beautifully. <laughs> um, I want to start by saying it's so nice to, to virtually be in Hawaii. Um, it's six o'clock in the morning here, so if I'm still drinking my coffee, I hope you will forgive me for that. And uh, I'm seeing a lot of, of old, old friends on the chat, which is really lovely. So I want to start by talking about, just give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about. There are two parts to what I would like to, to talk about. One is the the content of my book, which is, of course, the loving across cultures and, and the lessons of that. And that's the main subject of the book. The second part of that is to talk about what it is to write across cultures and, and my whole transition from academic writing to creative writing, because I have done a, a major reinvention post what when I started doing creative writing at, at age 63. So um, I wanna talk about that as well. And I hope that you'll have some questions for me at the end. So please make a note of those because I, I will leave time for, for answering those. If you have not read the book, Rabbit in the Moon, I want to give you just a, uh, a little more information than Craig did about what's in that. It's, it's really, it's written in three parts. Um, the first part takes place in Hawaii, and that's the beginning of my cross-cultural relationship, as well as my relationship with Hawaii and my, my learning to position myself as a Haole in Hawaii. Um, the center portion of it is the 
story of a year, Fred's um, sabbatical year, when we moved to Hong Kong, but we lived on the small island of Changchao, which is where his family lives. It's about a um, 20, more like about a half hour ferry ride from Hong Kong Island and, and the hustle and bustle of the big city. And the third part of it, and that section is about culture shock and acculturation. The third part of the book is about coming back to my own family and having reverse culture shock after the experience of spending a year in my now adopted Chinese family. So that's the, the sort of brief overview of the book. I wanna start by saying Fred and I are the subject of this book and uh, it could not have happened anywhere but Hawaii. We were a relationship that began in Hawaii that developed in Hawaii. We made our first home there. We were there for 20 years. Um, and it was the perfect location, of course, for a cross-cultural relationship. And there's nothing unusual about a cross-cultural relationship in Hawaii. If we had been in Texas where I was living, it would have been a very different kind of set of dynamics. We wouldn't have had the kind of outside support and the kind of normalcy that comes from, from being in a cross-cultural relationship in Hawaii. And not only was it a, a perfect location for that, it was also a perfect location for us in that our families were almost equally distant from us. Mine on the West Coast uh, in Washington State, his in Hong Kong, uh, we could travel to both places back when people could travel and we could have them visit us and they did. And so my first experiences of culture shock and comparative culture really happened with the visits of our families and seeing the comparisons between that. Actually, it was my year of graduation from the University of Hawaii when uh, we had visits from both families and I found that, that dealing them was very different. In fact, in the book, I describe it as uh, oatmeal, that our, his clumped and mine dissipated like dry oats because we could never find my family and his family wanted to be together all the time. So I started seeing that, that there were some differences, but I found it easy to deal with because they were far away. We could go and come back. Um, my introduction to Asia was also through Hawaii. Um, now I kind of think of it as China light. Um, I started learning about China through the East West Center uh, in 1997. I went for my first Summer Institute at the East West Center on infusing Asian studies into the undergraduate curriculum. Then the following year in 1998, I went to the East West Center again in the summer. This is when I was a college teacher in Texas. And I did the uh, a five week seminar on Chinese minorities, ethnic minorities in China and Chinese nationalism. And Fred was in that seminar. And that was when we met and our lives changed drastically because we fell in love and tried to figure out how we were gonna do long distance romance. A year later, he got a job in Hawaii and a year later I had started in the PhD program at the uh, American Studies Department. So it was, it was one of those cases where when you take one step in a direction and everything else starts to, to, to follow. So my, my Chinese Introduction was through Hawaii. I also did uh, a field study in China the year that I started my PhD program, and that was also through the East West Center. So that was my first trip to China. And then after that, when Fred moved there, I had access to the Chinese community in Hawaii as well. Um, some of you know that Fred was conducting a, a Chinese choir called the Han Chung Choir for many years in Hawaii. And we were invited into their homes. We were um, integrated into that community. Although if you've read the book, you know, I wasn't integrated until I got married. They were still looking for a Chinese wife for him until we were official. But uh, we had access to a lot of different parts of the Chinese community, not just through um, Fred's directorship at the Center for Chinese Studies, but also through, through the local community. And um, that was, was yet another window into um, some of the, the cultural values, but also some of the conflicting politics, because even within Hawaii, there were politics between 
um, Taiwanese, mainland Chinese and Hong Kong people and, and differing opinions, but it was all pretty, um, pretty mild compared to what I hear now. And so that was, was my beginning and all that. When we first started traveling to Hong Kong and spending time with his family, I discovered that despite all my years of teaching multiculturalism in Texas and also in Hawaii and studying culture in Hawaii, both through my field work for my first book and through teaching, didn't really translate into real experience. So um, I quickly learned that I had a lot of obstacles to, to acculturation, to, to fitting in to his family and fitting into the Hong Kong environment, um, not least of which was my own personality because I'm an introvert. I am hypersensitive to noise and confusion and to, uh, I was picky about foods. There were all kinds of things. I was a vegetarian and there was pork in every meal. There were all kinds of things that I had to navigate when I got there. And it was quite a wake up call to realize that I had all this, um, this intellectual information and cultural information, and yet I couldn't navigate on a daily basis. So this, the process of becoming part of a family and learning to fit in in an environment different than my own through immersion um, really became the core of the book. And I'll talk a little later about how, how the book grew from thinking I was just going to write that part to, to its current form. When we moved to Changchao, um, I see that Mari Yoshihara is in the audience and she was uh, the only person from Hawaii that came to visit us while we were there and she actually stayed with us so she knows intimately what it was like there. We did not live in the kind of environment that most people uh, who visit Hong Kong or even most people who live in Hong Kong have an experience with. Um, people think of skyscrapers, they think of the the crowds, the luxury shopping, the amazing food, the, the, the constant um, movement and, and sound of people that happens in the main part of the city. But we were out in a, in a village environment. Fred grew up on the small island of Changchao. It has no cars. Uh, it's known for its seafood restaurants. People from the city take, um, a ferry out there, either the fast or the slow ferry, they spend the day. So it's a good place for day trips. A lot of people send their children to camp there because there are YMCA and various other kinds of camps out in spaces where there are more space. There's hiking trails. Uh, it's a lovely place. Uh, the place, the main part of it is the village that is tiny back streets, open markets, um, and the, the kind of slower pace not as slow as Hawaii, but much slower pace than, than the central part of Hong Kong. And so we were in a, uh, an area where we were constantly um, in contact with the kind of daily life of people in a small village where they're drying fish, their laundry's hanging over the street. Um, if you walk down the street, you hear the sounds of mahjong from the upper windows. Uh, all the buildings are th only three stories tall. Um, and it's a, a very different sort of, of environment. I thought when I first met the Lao family that they were typical of Chinese families. And over time I learned from talking to other people that they were envied for being more traditional than other families because they had, at the time I was there, there were uh, two generations living in the family, but there had been as many as five at one time. Uh, when Fred was growing up, there were over 20 people in the small house. They, there are three brothers that live in the house together um, and they share the administration of the family. They share meals together. Um, this is the way that, that they have always lived. And so all of the children of those three families see each other as brothers and sisters. It's a it's a much more um, communal environment than I've ever been. I grew up in a household where every child had their own room. 
and well, a shared one for a while and I hated it. Uh, the rest of the time we had our own rooms, we, we tended to separate and our emphasis was always on, on our, our space and our own individual rights. So it's quite different being in an environment like that and very overwhelming. And of course, I don't speak Cantonese a little bit. I can swear and I can order food, um, but I'm still not adept in, in either Mandarin or Cantonese. So that was a handicap. But as Craig mentioned, my, my saving grace or what I would come to find was my best tool for acculturation was my interest in culture. My academic background in, is in folklore studies uh, and cultural anthropology. And because I'm fascinated by culture and I am used to stepping back enough that I can begin to analyze why people are doing the things that they're doing, that gave me a way to start looking at people and activities and environments um, rather than just reacting to them. So if I could analyze, if I could figure out why people were doing what they were doing and using what I often refer to as anthro brain, um, I could find a way to step out of my own discomfort enough to begin to um, understand what I was seeing. And I use this in a lot of different environments as well when I'm, when I'm reacting to, to being feeling overly stimulated I think that worked for me, but it also worked against me because I had spent 15 years in Texas learning Southwest multiculturalism, teaching literature, teaching folklore to students and having them do projects with their families. I'd spent a lot of time learning about different cultures in mainland US, which I then had to unlearn when I got to Hawaii because the histories are different, as everyone knows. The histories are different. The demographics are different. Um, people's understanding of each other and the intermingling is very, very different. So I had to unlearn that multiculturalism, learn it again in Hawaii, much of it through my dissertation research, and then later through doing the same kinds of projects with my students in a course I, I used to teach called Hawaii's Multiculturalism. And, and I know that that term is very fraught now, but, but it's yet to be re replaced with something equally as useful. Um, so having that consciousness also made me hypersensitive about giving offense and made me much more aware of what I can't call anything other than white guilt and feeling that I was, um, that I stood out, that I was somehow offensive just for being there, that I was different, that I was somehow um, more capable of insult than, than other people. It's interesting to me now when I ride the subway and I don't even think about feeling foreign. I don't feel, even if I'm the only white person in the train in, or in my car, it never really occurs to me to feel that I'm standing out. But at the time I felt very hyper aware of my difference and apologetic for that. And I think that that is, was also an obstacle to, to acculturating. Um, but on the other hand, as I said, my, my curiosity about culture and my, my interest in um, the festivals, the rituals, the, even, even the, the food preparation, those kinds of things, slowly drew me out of that. I started a blog, um, very small. I was too um, self-conscious to put it on the internet. And so I did it only for family and friends. But uh, if you've read the book, you know that my Chinese family started signing into it. And then I felt like I had an audience that I had to be careful with. I wrote it at the beginning so that I could, um, I could process the things that I was dealing with, but then I had to be aware of not making jokes about, I don't know, things like pressed duck and naked chicken heads and various other things to not sound like so much like an outsider. So I then started editing what I, what I wrote, but I never made it public. Later that blog, those blog posts would become a really good record of the cycle of festivals and, um, and rituals that 
were taking place. And that was another difference that I had access to on Chang Chao that people in urban Hong Kong and outsiders and even expats who have lived in Hong Kong for 30 years might not have access to because I was in a family and I was in a village and I was in an environment where those things were still practiced. I had access to a year long cycle of festivals and rituals um, from the big public festivals like the Bun Festival for which uh, uh, Chang Zhao is very famous to the very small things like the offerings that are made within the home, the offerings that are made in the courtyard, the, uh, the offerings that are made when during Qingming going up to the, the cemetery for the annual grave sweeping ceremonies to be involved within that. And another advantage I had was of course, I had an excellent translator in my husband who, and he is also somebody who is, um, connected to these things through, through his theoretical training in ethnomusicology. So we share that interest in culture. You may know in your own family that there's usually one person in a family who's the culture bearer or the one who's interested in the family stories. And my, in my family, there are two, me and my brother, but we have very different interests. He likes the facts and I like the, the anecdotes. Um, Fred is that person in his family collecting the stories and hearing them, whereas other people who are more involved in the present and not so interested in the past are not likely to do that. So those were all things that worked in my favor. So I can't take full credit for um, the kinds of observations that, that I recorded um, because it was always teamwork. I was always getting getting some assistance through, through translation. Um, but I did ask a lot of questions and that also gave me access to a role in the family because my questions translated back to my in-laws showed my interest in traditions that are now starting to disappear. The last time we went for Qingming this year, we went for Qingming and it was a much, much uh, reduced family group. People were going in, in small groups rather than the whole village going at one time. But we went with some of the family members and some of the, the cousins and uh, some of the children that have grown children who have moved into the city, who come out to uh, Changzhou to go visit the, the graves of their great grandparents and their grandparents. And I asked one of the younger members of the family if they would do this in the future when, when their grandparents were gone or maybe when their parents were gone. And he stopped to think for a minute and he said, I don't think so. And then he said, well, maybe, maybe we'll do it online. Maybe it'll all be online in the future. And I thought, how sad. The, the ancestors are going to be really lonely because nobody's gonna be coming and giving offerings for them. But this is very much the case with throughout the diaspora as well is that people get distanced from the sites of their, their culture. And then through modernization, through moving apart, through all kinds of uh, things that speed up our lives, they lose track of those uh, traditions. And, and actually one of the surprise audiences um, for my book has been Chinese American friends in Hawaii, well, not just friends, also other people in Hawaii, in Canada, in the mainland US, who are very appreciative of the details of the, the rituals and traditions in the book, because they all have a story about how they don't do those things anymore. They remember their grandparents doing those things. They wish they knew more about it, or they do them and they don't know why. So, so those are, um, that was an unexpected bonus to hear back from those people and to see that this had value for them as a way of looking at those traditions. And my mother-in-law has expressed her, her fear that, that people won't do these things anymore. They won't have time or they won't have the knowledge um, and it won't be transmitted to the younger people. On the other hand, every time I go to the cemetery, I see some parent standing behind a child, holding their hands and teaching them to, to count out with the incense, teaching them or talking about the, the various niches in the, in the 
the columbarium or, or in the grave sites and telling stories around them. So I, I hope at least the stories are being transmitted. But tradition was, was a huge part of, of my um, process of fitting in as well as my process of learning to understand what I was seeing when I was there. And of course, now I'm back here, which I never thought I would be. Um, and I'd like to say one more thing that in about Hawaii being so important to this whole process, because another thing that I've discovered in learning and unlearning and relearning multiculturalism in different places and contexts is that Hawaii gave me a vocabulary that I hadn't had before, a vocabulary that included humor. Um, I used to teach a unit in my Hawaii multiculturalism course on ethnic humor, which I know has you know, been in disfavor in a lot of contexts, but certainly still exists within um, local communities and be within families as well, certainly within families because families in Hawaii often have multiple ethnicities and use situational ethnicity to navigate daily life. And humor is often a part of that. And I have found in moving to Hong Kong and also in traveling back to mainland US that I have to temper the things that I say because Fred and I are very used to talking about race, talking about ethnicity, talking about culture in ways that other people overhearing that find offensive. Um, but we learned that in Hawaii and we, it works within our relationship because we don't have to hide anything. We're constantly talking about where our tastes come from, where our values come from. Um, one of the questions I often get asked is, who is dominant in your relationship? I don't know why people ask that. Um, but I, my, that my answer is always, it depends on where we are. Um, when we were in Hawaii, I could, my bottom line was always, we're in my culture, this is my turf. Uh, in, and of course, done with humor. In Hong Kong, I'm on his turf and I often have to ask how things should be done or he's often explaining, not so much anymore, but in the past explaining what I need to do in order to, to be a good citizen of a family and of the community and how I need to uh, conduct myself. Everything from continuing to fill up somebody's tea cup on, at the table to um, how to greet people uh, in, in various environments or at Chinese New Year, uh, what I need to do in order to appear less of an outsider. I'm granted a lot of leeway as an outsider, but I'm also an insider. And as an insider, it's my privilege and my courtesy then to, to adapt and to learn to uh, conduct myself in a way that shows that I understand and respect the culture. And of course, all of that requires being willing to laugh at yourself, which I was never good at. And I've had to learn to do both in Hawaii and in Hong Kong. And I think that that's maybe what breaks down the final barrier of um, being an outsider is being willing to look ridiculous sometimes, being willing to be embarrassed and being willing to laugh along with other people at yourself. And that becomes the, 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 the thing that melts the ice between people. And also in Hong Kong, I've discovered being being white in Hong Kong is a whole different thing. If anything, I have to fight the colonial mentality that wants to give me um, more credit than I'm due because I am a total outsider to this environment. I have none of the past knowledge and I have not had either the status granted to um, colonial powers in the past or the knowledge that they acquired. So I think from here, I'd like to transition into what it takes to write across cultures and, and talk about that a little bit. And uh, again, I hope you'll have some questions for me at the end. I want to talk about, um, first of all, Craig mentioned my first book, which is American Aloha, I always forget the subtitle, Cultural Tourism and the Negotiation of Tradition on the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. Um, Jeff White is in the audience and he was one of my advisors and so was Mario Shahara. This was my dissertation that became a book. I had the opportunity when researching this to go out and 
uh, talk to people in different ethnic communities in Hawaii when I was new to Hawaii and interview people of the nine ethnic groups that had traveled to Washington DC to represent Hawaii on the National Mall um, as a multi-ethnic environment. So uh, Hawaii was the featured state that year and my experience of interviewing people was, was an amazing experience of getting to know people, not just in Honolulu, but also in the, the neighbor islands as well. And to hear their, their take on um, both the festival and, and their position within the community. I also have a PhD in American studies from, from the University of Hawaii and, from, and I taught in the um, American studies department. And then as you probably know, I was the curator at Iolani Palace, which was an entirely different kind of environment where I was one of only three Haoles working within the palace um, trying to create new ways to interpret Native Hawaiian history vis-a-vis -vis the US to, to present it to the public. So I saw that all as a continuation. Uh, it seems like uh, sort of serial monogamy in terms of jobs, but it's that, it's that too. But I went from, from American studies and from the kind of research I did into the palace and took all of that with me uh, because working in, in, a, in a museum is also kind of education and working as a facilitator and mediator between cultures, um, trying to, to create understanding between those. I want to take uh, do something a little bit different here. What I, if I can find my cursor, there we go. Um, in this transition to academic, from academic writing to creative writing, I've done a lot of lyric essays and I'd like to read you just one section from an essay that I published earlier this year that speaks to this shift in consciousness as well as a shift in style. This was an essay that I published in Sky Island Journal. It's called The Absence of Color. And I just wanna read you the very first section of this. It's, the first section is called Tints, and all of it is based on, there are three parts, and they're all based on uh, black and white in painting. Makeup promises beauty miracles, but in Asia, makeup promises miracles of whiteness. The women on the boxes are the gleaming sisters of Snow White with their ebony hair and alabaster skin, lightning, brightening, fair and lovely, pure, milk, snow, ivory, perfect white, white perfection. When I show my nearly empty bottle of foundation to the shop girl, she shakes her head. They have my brand, but they don't carry that color in Hong Kong, only Asian colors. I look at her pale, poor free skin that has never seen sun and wonder what she sees. Guaipo, white ghost, Caucasian, white. She turns my bottle over and looks at the number code on the base, says maybe she can find something close. She runs her manicured hand across the rows of bottles, the palette of perfectibility from milk to clotted cream, from porcelain to ecru. I mention that I have yellow undertones and tuck away the irony. She selects a shade from the darker end of the limited spectrum. She squirts a drop of makeup onto my hand, rubs it in and nods. My new shade, she announces, is cool vanilla. I think how in America, vanilla connotes boring, plain, unadventurous, mainstream. As we walk to the cash register, she inspects me closely and asks if I use whitening products. I shake my head and smile. I resist the urge to tell her that I have already been too white most of my life. So that's an example of the kind of creative writing that I'm doing now. And I hope that you can see that within that, it allows me to talk about things in a, in a more emotive, more intuitive way than I could when I was doing theory-based academic writing. So I think the biggest shift in, in moving from academic to creative writing is shifting from objectivity to subjectivity and trying to evoke feeling as opposed to, I mean, thought as well, but um, thought through feeling, moving from theory to poetry, um, trying to move from you know a formulaic kind of structure where you tell people what you're going to do and you do it and you support it and then you tell them what you've done in academic writing to trying to um, create a narrative arc 
uh, or to do these kinds of creative juxtapositions that I'm doing in the, in the lyric essays, it was all very different. I felt like I had to unlearn everything I had learned about academic writing and begin again. Um, the things that link them together, of course, are research and reflection and uh, a sense of mission. I'm still using my, my ethnographic training, my, my, my folklore training, but I think that, and, and of course there are ethical considerations as well. Um, there are lots of people getting sued over memoirs, uh, but not that so much as not wanting to create caricatures, just stay away from stereotypes. Um, fortunately, we don't have to fill out human subject forms, but we do have to think about the, the legal and ethical ramifications of writing about other people in, in memoir. Uh, fortunately, uh, I, as I said, I had translators. Language was a huge issue as well because I don't speak Cantonese. And I'm going to end by reading you just one little section about how I dealt with language issues in the book and in my actual acculturation process. This is from a, a section of the book called Heritage Tour when Fred and I were visiting Hong Kong. As Fred asks questions, I wait for a lull, caught in the lag time before translation, translation perpetually out of conversational sync. I watch how his father's facial expressions and gestures accompany the pitches, slides, and falls of his tones how the drawn out vowels add drama to the telling. Abba seems agitated and points to a man in the front row. His friend who helped him escape, Fred explains. As his father's storytelling picks up speed, my after the fact version arrives and fits and starts. As usual, I am primed for suspense, drama and comedy before I know the story. It's as if I'm first watching a movie with the sound turned off before getting a recap of the dialogue. I can feel and see the intensity of this story. So that's an example of my being in a Cantonese environment, Cantonese speaking environment and finding other ways to understand the action. So I'm going to stop here and open this to questions. If anybody has questions for me about either about the book, um, about my experience in Hong Kong or about um, moving from academic to creative writing. Okay, and thank you very much, Heather. And uh, I think Steve O'Hara had his hand up first. So Steve, you can either enter it in the chat or I think Paige would be able to uh, turn your microphone on if you wanted to do it that way. Okay, while we're waiting to just resolve that, uh, I'm going to go with one of the immediate uh, questions that I had. Uh, could you explain the title? Yeah, um, this was not the title for a long time and I was, I was clinging to a different title that everybody told me was terrible. Um, the title of this book for a long time was Hot and Noisy, which of course is the Brunel, the, the, um, the Chinese aesthetic of things happening and having lots of noise and, and bright lights. Uh, I wanted a title that encompassed the, the cultural difference. And for me, that did that. But then Rabbit in the Moon came about uh, in the editing after I, my book was uh, at Camp for Press and I was working with the editor. And I remembered a scene in the very first chapter where Fred and I are sitting outside of Lincoln Hall at uh, the East West Center and looking at a full moon. And he's showing me the rabbit in the moon and I can't see it. I keep saying, I see a man. I see a man in the moon. And he said, you have to have Chinese eyes in order to see the rabbit in the moon. And then I realized that that pretty much encompassed the whole story because it was really about my learning to see with Chinese eyes. And so uh, then we ended up, I want to talk just a minute about the, the cover graphic because this is the, a, Chinese, a traditional Chinese paper cut is the idea behind the black part here. And then uh, Fred's cousin's wife, who is a graphic designer, Ida Wong, designed that for me. And I think she did a really beautiful job. 
can I say something now? Yep, you're all set, Steve. Okay. Uh, first of all, this is a wonderful talk. I really congratulate you. Um, and it mirrors my own experience. I mean, just about everything you said, I kept saying, right on, right on. But of course, you couldn't hear me uh, because I have had lived 50 years plus in a, in a Vietnamese family. And there's so many parallels. So I just wanted to congratulate you on what I thought was an excellent, terribly insightful talk with one question. I speak Vietnamese. Uh, that's what I do for a living, I'm teaching. I speak Chinese too. Uh, Mandarin, maybe. Um, and it has one of my experiences, and I wonder how you relate to this. When I go to Vietnam, it takes me about two days of speaking to everybody in Vietnamese that I'm thinking in Vietnamese. I see, and I know it because when I sleep, I have dreams in Vietnamese. I don't dream in English. And I noticed about myself, it took me a while to see this, that my body language changes, the kind of questions I ask people, my reactions to people, when I'm entirely in Vietnamese in my own mind, as well as in my speech and interactions, I become someone slightly different from who I am when I'm here speaking English. I don't know how that observation would you know, appear to you, and I'd really like to hear your comment, and I'm going to hang up and listen to what you have to say. Thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you, Stephen. I think that you're right on with all of that's a great observation. And first of all, I envy you your language skills. Um, I One of the things I talked about in the book was how different Fred was when he went from Hawaii to Hong Kong. <clears throat> when he's in a Cantonese-speaking environment, his body language changes, his tone of voice changes, particularly when he's around his family. And maybe we all do this. Um, our first culture is always our families. And we speak and, and act in a certain way when we're around our family members that uh, you know, is sort of programmed into our, our very selves, I think. And I think when he went there, what I started saying was he was, I, I first saw it as rougher and gruffer and louder and more brisk, less demonstrative than he was when he was in Hawaii. But he was fitting into the way his family communicates, which I first interpreted as a lot of arguing and then realized, oh, it's just lively interaction, but they don't use the same facial expressions I'm used to. Um, they, they sort of lean forward, they gesticulate a lot, they talk over each other. I thought they were yelling at each other all the time and they are yelling at each other, but it's happy yelling. It's not, it's not what in my family would immediately be um, categorized as unpleasant kind of conversation and probably would, would never happen in the first place because that's not how we interact. I think now that I've been in, in this environment longer and I've had to learn to, you know, I'm often an observer, but when I'm not observing, when I'm allowing myself to, to step in and participate, um, when it shifts to English, I think that I'm probably taking on different kinds of mannerisms as well. I think that that becomes part of the interaction. In order to be an insider, you begin to, to watch and um, imitate the way other people talk. I will never be one of the, the loudest people, but there are introverts within the Lao family as well. And I watch them to see how they interact. And so I think that, that learning those kinds of, of other ways of communicating, which I've become really expert at watching when I can't understand what's being said, um, becomes part of the way that, that you fit into an environment. How we, I don't know, I'm gonna have to watch that now. It's really interesting. Thank you for that question. And John Zern has uh, put a comment in uh, and a question. A great talk, Heather. I appreciated your description of your shift from scholarly objectivity to a more subjective orientation in your writing. Did you find that particular conceptual frameworks from anthropology still informed your approach to narrating your own experience? Huh, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I think I mean, certainly I'm still thinking in those ways, but, you know, again, we're going from subjectivity to objectivity. I think that was a real challenge in my book too, because when I'm describing the festivals, 
and the uh, the rituals, I think I had a tendency in the early drafts to describe them in a very objective way and, and get other parts of the book, the beginning section about the building of our relationship, the second, the third part about um, encounters with my family, my father's death, traveling with my mother are very subjective. And so I needed to balance the interiority of the first and second parts with what I was doing in the center part. And so I had to later, in later drafts, really work on putting myself into those environments because from an anthropological perspective, you know, the kind of ethnographic writing I've done before, I removed myself. You know, you qualify yourself, but you remove yourself. Um, and instead I needed to subjectify those sections. And, and that was really challenging. I, I don't even know if I've, entirely accomplished that. Um, but, but that was certainly what I was trying to do is to um, kind of mediate between my, my analysis of those things as, a, as, a, as an ethnographer and my subjective experiences of being within it. So for instance, I talk about a parade in uh, on Peng, Peng Chao and I, I ended up being in the parade. So I spent a lot of time talking about how I felt about being in the midst of all of that, yet I was also observing what was going on around us and, and trying to analyze that. So yeah, that was a, that was a real challenge. And, and so I think it works, always works both for and against me. It helps me with, with collecting details, um, but it can get in the way of, of the, the subjectivity. And, and I think subjectivity and vulnerability are so crucial to memoir uh, and finding a way to, to weave those together is really challenging. Sorry, and if other people have questions, here we are. Here's Anjali Shivam, who's our Fulbright scholar who is here for two months at the center. Um, thank you for this wonderful talk. Could you please speak more to ethnic humor as a tool of inclusion and exclusion and also as a narrative form? Thank you so much. Hmm. I don't think, well, we don't use it in a narrative form anymore. I mean, if you're, if you're talking about ethnic humor and narrative form, we'd be talking about, about jokes that have a sort of story arc to them, those kinds of things. So at least that's how I interpret that. But and I, I learned a lot of that when, you know, from everybody from Frank DeLima on to other people in Hawaii that, that have used that kind of humor to talk about, often about ethnic groups to which they belong. So it's, I think that makes, it's often a difference between ethnic humor in Hawaii and ethnic humor elsewhere. Ethnic humor elsewhere uh, is often told within a group about people in a different group. You don't want them to hear it because it's offensive to other people, but it communicates a certain kind of sensibility about victimization or uh, exploitation or various other things uh, or, or just difference. It's a way of community building within a community. Uh, so in Hawaii, I found from my students that people often, and also from friends, that people often use ethnic humor about themselves which makes it more permissible. So if I make jokes, I used to cry over Howley jokes. I thought I'll never fit in. They're so mean. Uh, and I had students who said, oh, Hawaii is the most racist place I've ever been. And they were usually white students from the military. Uh, and they were hearing it, because they were being othered and marginalized for the first time, feeling racially marked in ways they never had before. Within Hawaii, people are talking about situational ethnicity. So, you know, you're Filipino when you're in one environment and you're Hawaiian in another environment and Holly in a different environment, depending on the context. And people can navigate that or they have those ethnicities in different family members and they use those jokes as a way or those kinds of stereotypes, I think more than anything, the stereotyping to show awareness of taste and of behaviors. And it's a way in which people, if you can laugh at yourself, if I can tell, make jokes about how obnoxious Hollies are, it shows that I'm aware of the way that other people look at my bigger group. I'm aware of the history. I'm aware of the, the kinds of, of 
actual offenses that have been committed and are committed every day. Um, and it allows you to cross that line um, in the same way that tall tales work. Um, and go back to my folklore studies. If you, a tall tale is often told to trick somebody, to trick somebody on the outside. And when somebody finds out they're tricked, they have a choice. They can either get really mad and not have anything to do with you anymore, or they can laugh at themselves at which point they cross the line. They become an insider. They get to trick the next person. So it's, a, it's kind of a, used as a, uh, a test of your ability to, to be fluid with your identity. I don't know if that explains it, but that's the best I can. Within, you know, within my own relationship, we, we talk about holly tastes and, and Chinese tastes a lot. And, and in the same way that in Hawaii, the same term, you know, pake for Chinese can just mean Chinese. It's a noun or it's an adjective that means cheap. You know, so it plays on a characteristic that is, does not apply to everyone, but it's one that many Chinese people use to joke about themselves. Like you can't out pake a pake. All right, this is from um, Lili Chen, Chen Lili, who uh, is actually visiting with us at the center for a year and she's coming in doing uh, her doctoral work. Uh, from uh, uh, Peking University. Um, thank you very much for your wonderful talk. Actually, I'm quite familiar with the environment you described because I grew up in South China and Cantonese is my mother tongue. In traditional communal Chinese families, especially those in small villages like Changzhou, they usually have very specific and strict requirements to female, for female newcomers to the family, especially for daughters-in-law. But the white guilt you described may to some extent ease the pressure added to the newcomer. What kind of experience would that be and what kind of role would that be in your subjective writing? I know what I know what she's talking about in traditional, very traditional families, but I and I think from what I've heard from the stories I've heard from Fred that those kinds of challenges to, uh, you know, traditionally a woman marries out and she goes in a traditional family, goes to live with her husband's family and then is then under the rule of her mother-in-law who is often under the rule of her mother-in-law. And in, traditionally those could often be very fraught kinds of relationships with a lot of um, power differential. And I know from my mother-in-law story from Fred that, that some of that may have existed when she first came into the household and lived with her husband's mother, Fred's grandmother. But I have never experienced that sort of thing. And I find that hard to believe that it would be, that I don't know that that still goes on. I don't know, um, it, perhaps in, in small villages in some places, but I have been welcomed completely into the family. If anything, my white guilt didn't allow me to see how I was being welcomed. A lot of the, the kinds of, of um, attention that I was being given, I saw as supervision. And it was really just their effort to incorporate me into the family. I felt like I was being surveyed all the time because I was getting comments about how much rice I ate and <coughs> how much wine I had and how many books I was reading and I was gonna ruin my eyes and, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and, but it was all well-intentioned. So both our families, we've been very blessed. Both our families have been very welcoming. <coughs> okay, uh, the next question here is from Catherine Clay. Uh, thanks, Heather. What kind of work did you do to unlearn, unlearn the academies? I have noticed that it is so ingrained, not just in writing style, but in our, my ways of seeing, what I notice, what seems relevant, how I explain the world to myself, etc. Any tricks? I don't know about tricks. I, I took a lot of classes. I took, uh, I took courses through uh, an organization called creativenonfiction.org and I had a wonderful memoirist as my teacher. Uh, when I first started writing, in fact, when I started taking creative nonfiction courses, I actually thought I was gonna write a book about museums in Hawaii. 
And I had a contract with UH Press and I was ready to do that. And the more I wrote, the more I realized I didn't want to write that book. I had already left the palace. Um, I did a lot of research for it that all got shelved. And I spent a lot of time in, in creative writing courses, really trying to, to learn to write more subjectively. I had written like that when I was in my teens, but I had not allowed myself that kind of writing for a very long time. So um, I've learned a lot from other writers and, and I've had to really, I think, develop beginner's mind to start over again in many ways. Okay. Steve has another uh, question in here. Did you have to learn to be indirect in your comments? In Vietnamese, we say, criticize the dog to blame the cat. <laughs> um, I, I can only be, again, because I'm interacting mostly through Fred with the family, the, the older people, not, not the people in his generation. I, you know, Chinese people in my experience are really direct. I don't think that that's ever a problem. <laughs> Uh, people say say things to each other within the family that amaze me. I think if my siblings said those things to me, I would be really offended. Uh, recently, Fred got cataract surgery and was not wearing his glasses. And both his sister and his brother said he looked really old without his glasses. And he needed to get glasses with plain glass in them so he would look better. You know, people just say things very directly. Um, his mother used to pretend to cut off his ponytail and said, my son used to be so handsome, now so ugly. And he laughs and he thinks it's really funny. Um, so yeah, there's no indirection in the Lao family. It's usually pretty direct. I've had to unlearn indirection. <laughs> I was just gonna ask something I mentioned in the introduction. I, I know that, you know, from a variety of directions. I know that music has actually played a really central mm. part in both your lives. I mean, Fred is a astounding musician and ethnomusicologist, and I know you have a long background in proximity with and involved in music. I was just wondering how much is that still part of, or, or how does music figure into your writing, to your sense of cultural contact? Is it important or just a, a kind of pleasure and avocation? It's very important and I have no musical ability and no musical vocabulary and no music background. My, my background's in visual arts. I have a degree in, in painting, um, but you're right. Music has been around us all this time and around me in some of my past lives as well. Um, and I think it has been very important to my understanding of culture because through learning about Chinese culture, learning about Chinese music, because I've been around a lot of uh, Cantonese opera and I've been around a lot of, of mainland Chinese music, um, around a lot of musicians. I have also had access to um, various aspects of culture that I wouldn't have otherwise and aspects to ways to understand it. So for instance, when they have the annual bun festival on Changchao, we go the day before and we go for all the Taoist rituals and we go for the, the opera and it's all music, but I'm, I'm analyzing it in terms of, of culture. Fred's analyzing it, both that and, and, and musical analysis as well, but, but I have access to um, a vocabulary through him although I can only use parts of it. So um, it's, it's one of the bonuses, I think. And I think some music, you know, and I, and I understand too how music carries culture. So um, that was an important aspect of the book was to try and describe some of the, the sounds of the culture as well as the actions. And Steve jumped in again. Yeah, he's right. Welcome. Just goes to demonstrate that Vietnamese and Chinese social interactions may appear to outsiders to be the same. In this, they are quite different. I think that's uh, absolutely true. Very true. And Cindy Franklin put in, I'm sorry to slip out a few minutes early, but thank you for this, Heather, and great to see you. Are there any other uh, last questions that people would like to ask Heather?
I will just add a final one, given this is the brown bag series. Uh, what do you think, given the courses you were taking and the experience of having written a memoir, if you had advice to give people if they were thinking about writing a memoir or somehow or other writing about their family, what would be the two or three most important bits of advice you would give them? Hmm. I think one of the most important things is to read a lot of memoirs. There are some amazing memoirs out there. I've probably read 50 memoirs since I started doing this. Uh, and there are many, many ways to approach a story. And there are some, some fabulous examples of the different forms that memoir can take. Uh, I think a second thing is, is the, the importance of reflection and, and vulnerability in memoir. And uh, you know, authenticity, if you want to use that term, I think in the, I probably went through at least nine complete drafts of this book before it was completed. And I kept asking myself, is that true? Especially when writing about family, um, I, I think of it as sort of archeology span of the self that, that one has to keep asking uh, whether you're being honest with yourself and dropping through into deeper levels. And when it gets to the point where it's uncomfortable, then you're probably getting to where you really live. And I think that's what makes memoir work is that uh, the intimacy of it and that that's why people read it because they have entrance into somebody's deepest self through memoir. That's why I like to read them. So I think those things are very important. And there's some excellent resources out there in terms of, of courses and um, working with a community of writers who are doing the same kind of writing is also very important. Which I would like to suggest is an advertisement not only for the Center for Biographical Research and the journal Biography, but also the really fine nonfiction courses and uh, creative nonfiction courses being offered at the university. But yes, please read memoirs, think about memoirs, and then write memoirs. Um, two other things. I would first of all like to uh, thank Heather for this uh, talk. It's brought our semester to a close in a a uh, really gratifying way because you're able to talk not only about sort of criticism and theory and sort of academic distance on a subject like this, but also able to be uh, able to talk to about, about it um, sort of up close and personal.